Hello Joe, we're at COP26 and today is the day of cities, regions and the built environment. And we've talked a lot today about some of the, some of the things that need to happen. And I wanted to hear from you what you think some of the cultural challenges that we need to sort of see in order to transform our industry, the construction industry and the built environment. Well, my hope is that we actually move back to the culture that existed when I started my career 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, computers were really disrupting what was going on in the built environment. They were allowing us to design completely differently. It meant that people didn't default to codes of practice. We had to think in terms of first principles. And so it was hugely creative. And it was wonderful for me as a new graduate. Um, but I think over the last 30 years, that pendulum has swung from creativity to compliance. and you know, the only really creative people left in the value chain sometimes seem to be the architects and the, the design engineers. Um, and really, I was always taught that, you know, with the built environment, really successful buildings come about because it's a sort of three-legged stool. You've got architects, you've got engineers, but you've also got clients who have got imagination. They want to do something differently. And so I feel that there's actually something really exciting going on here and that we're moving into a new era of design where the engineers are really central to it because they're the problem solvers but we can only work with people who are further up the value chain who who want us to to find those solutions so if i think about this i'm going to use the term supply chain rather than value because i think value is everywhere so I'm, um, but i'm thinking about the delivery end as well and the role of contractors mechanical contractors uh, they haven't been as present uh, in the discussions today and I think they are a really, really important part of our, our industry. And do you think there's a transformation in terms of just more of a cohesive uh, unit that we need to be operating in order to achieve the change that we need? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the, one of the real problems at the moment is if you think about that supply chain for a building, starting with the investor and the developer, going through the design team, the contractors, the material suppliers, you know, the, the small contractors who are on site, that's a very, very stretched out chain. And it's got these awful disconnects along the way in terms of procurement. But actually, where I see that we'll have to get to is that that sort of concertinaing and becoming becoming much more tighter and you know the example I refer to is that you know back in the late 80s early 90s I wanted to design a building in timber and no one really designed buildings in timber in the UK then it was steel or concrete luckily I found someone in Arup who knew about timber and he sat me down and he said now timber Joe is very different you know timber is not homogenous you need to go and you, know, you need to get to know the timber fabricator the timber contractor you need to probably go and choose your timber from a lumber yard and there was that sort of craftsmanship element of it, and you had to really understand your material. And so I designed that building, I designed it in timber. By the time it was finished, by the time the design was finished, I knew where the wood was coming from. I knew the contractor who was going to build it. And I think that that's what's going to happen in future. And I had a very similar conversation yesterday with a, the sustainability lead at Accelerator Mittel, which is a big steel company. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, steel, most of the steel is recycled, but they still have to make a lot of new steel because there's more demand than there is supply. And we were talking about how you, you rather than melt down steel to recycle it, how do you reuse steel components? And we were having exactly the same conversation and saying, you know, we need to, we need to find people who will supply those, you know, um, supply those steel beams, you know, you know, um, so steel yards that will accept secondhand steel, yeah. um, and and then that, you know, that's how we can set a new. I mean, frankly, it's a circular business model, and that's that's the shift. We've got to get away from this sort of stretched out linear supply chain and get to a much more circular one. So, what I'd like to um, come to, the, for example, the use of timber, is but one example of not the built environment just being responsible for emissions and then reducing emissions. But is there a role for the built environment actually doing more than that? So for example, the use of timber at large, writ large, gosh, you know, how significant a role could the built environment play in actually helping sequester greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide? So if we grow trees, it's a great idea, but after 100 years, you've got to do something with them. And actually using them in construction and therefore allowing that land to then grow yet more trees, 
this is about thinking differently about the role of the built environment, not just in terms of emissions, but actually its role in helping us with emissions uh, removal from the atmosphere. How do you think, that, you know, what are the think, innovations that you hear about? <laughs> I think, you know, I think this is incredibly important. I mean, fundamentally, we've got an absurd situation where we've got a culture where we extract materials, we assemble them into buildings or, or products, and when we finish with them, we demolish them, and it ends up in landfill. You know, and it's a, you know, there's very few benefits other than the singular purpose, which, which the purpose of, of that whole exercise was about. Um, and it's just, it's just absurdly wasteful. And so, what I see in the future is that we'll be thinking about buildings much more as repositories of materials. And so building components will have material passports. And by that, what I mean is like a QR code. So that every single bit of the building, you know what it is and you know, where it came from. And, you know, we've actually done an experiment on this um, with the Dutch Pavilion um, in Europe. And what we set out to do was to build a building that could be completely um, dismantled, you know, after a period of time, and all the products returned to the manufacturer. And so that meant no screws, no glue, all the connection designs had to be completely different. But as soon as we worked out the problem we were trying to solve, of course, several weeks later, it was solved. And we sourced all the materials and, you know, the building went up and it was up for two months and then it came down and the, 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 everything went back, slightly second hand, a little bit battered, but, you know, no holes in it or, or anything. Now, that, that's a completely different way about thinking about buildings and of course timber buildings you know is a vital because provided that you use the timber in the right way then you know you're you're keeping the carbon locked up and you know that that's again something that that we should be doing you know much more of and we've just got to we've got to just change our mindsets um, and think much more expansively about what we're doing and think about how it can benefit people in terms of jobs and you know benefit and, and what's going to happen not just in the next five or ten years but for the next you know 50 or even 500 years well what a fantastic note to end on joe i've you know you filled me with enthusiasm and excitement for the role of the built environment in tackling climate change and it's been great chatting with you no well, thank you i wish i was 30 years younger and could start my career all over again thank you